Um, I guess, could you give us a little background as to what Prop 215 is, the Compassionate Care Act, and what really happened in the 80s and the 90s that got public support for medical marijuana? Well, really, you have to look back to uh, the Harvey Milk days in San Francisco in the early 90s. And what was going on there was the in the early 90s, the AIDS epidemic broke out, and people were dying right and left uh, from this disease AIDS. And what happened was is that people like Dennis Perone came out of the you know came out and helped patients get their medicine, and he started one of the first organizations in San Francisco before there was even a law on the books about it, and there were literally almost everyone was dying and the only comfort that they found or that they could tolerate was using medical cannabis and so they did and it um, it got ground there in San Francisco um, medical cannabis gained ground and what happened out of that experience in dealing with AIDS and and having medical cannabis available to them was Proposition 215. Proposition 215 was born out of the trauma of AIDS patients. Just to clarify, I guess, how many, how many people do you think uh, in the country are kind of have this chronic pain and are dependent on marijuana? Is it a significant amount? I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's a very large percentage of our population. I think one of the concerns is that people aren't really sure these, these people who are getting the marijuana actually need it. Um, but can you attest to a lot of the patients who actually need it? I mean, what, what kind of condition would you need to be dependent on marijuana to help soothe the pain? Well, nowadays? if a person had a, con a condition that was debilitating, like, say, for example, insomnia is a good one. A lot, of pe a lot of law enforcement complain about this. Oh, the person says they have insomnia. But if you've ever known someone with insomnia, they can't sleep all night, and then they're tired all day long, so they can't perform the duties at their job. And most people would consider that a serious illness. And some people scoff at that, saying, well, that's not a very serious illness, because they don't understand the nature of the illness. It's real easy for um, people that don't have serious illnesses to think that, that people that you know, are claiming serious illnesses or that look healthy, you know, a lot of, a lot of people that have what they consider serious illnesses and their doctors consider serious illnesses don't necessarily, aren't necessarily vomiting all over the place because of nausea or, um, or unable to walk because of their recent, um, their recent treatment at the, you know, radiation center. So it's, it, it's not, not everyone is suffering, you know, to such a degree that it would be recognizable um, by the look on their face when they're walking in the door of a patient association. Let's say that the drug just disappears overnight, that tomorrow there's no marijuana. Where would these people go? I mean, what, what would these people turn to for coping with pain? Well, a lot of, these, a lot of people would be left with their, um, with their malady. Uh, a, a lot of reasons why people turn to medical marijuana is because traditional drugs don't work for them. They don't work for them in a variety of reasons. One, it either bothers their uh, their system. It's, it's all side effects. You know, whether it's whether it's um, some symptom. You know, and, and you can choose any of the ones that you you know you see on these commercials where it says, "And this drug might produce," and then it says all the list of side effects. Well, you know, if they did the same com commercial for marijuana, it'd be, "Well, this drug produces cotton mouth, maybe a you know a, a, a short-term memory loss, uh, uh, bloodshot eyes." things that medical cannabis patients aren't too concerned about. And so uh, it's traditional pharmaceuticals pose a problem for a lot of people. A lot of people have been addicted to traditional pharmaceuticals to such a degree that they are incapable of taking traditional pharmaceuticals at all anymore. And so if they lost their ability to get medical cannabis at all, it would be quite a trauma for them. The federal government still maintains that marijuana is uh, poses the risk of being hi highly abusive. Um, is that pretty much obsolete now? Well, I haven't heard that particular study, although I wouldn't, be I wouldn't be surprised if it was. One of the things that I hear commonly is that it has no medical efficacy. Yet I can show you a patent in my office that's registered with the 
you know, the patent office that is assigned to the Department of Health and Human Services, and it is a patent for 26 different applications of medical cannabis. So they say one thing, you know, out of one side of their mouth, and they're doing something else out of the other side of their mouth. Okay. Um, I, a lot of business owners, I know over the summer, in, just in the valley, there was like a string of four, four dispensaries that were like violently robbed. Um, the business owners and homeowners who operate next to these dispensaries have voiced concerns about operating next to such places that attract crime. Um, do you have anything to say to those people? I certainly do. And what I would say is that they should support regulations. If they want to know what good regulations are, they can contact the Union of Medical Marijuana Patients. We are in the process of submitting a, an ordinance similar to the ordinances that are already on the table of city council to, um, to, regulate, to regulate dispensary operations, patient associations. The key here is regulation. And one of the problems that we've had in our culture so far is because there's been such a lackadaisical approach in adopting regulations that criminals, criminals think that it's okay to attack patient organizations, that it's going to be easy money and easy medicine, and that law enforcement isn't going to do anything. Some of the people that attack patient associations are the members themselves. They've already signed up with their card, they've turned in their driver's license, showed up, have their face on camera, and then robbed the location as if nothing's going to happen. And the fact of the matter is they're wrong. Police are doing something about it, but there is a perception, a public perception, that because uh, law enforcement has a, uh, has a bias against m marijuana, medical marijuana, medical cannabis, that nothing is going to happen. But those criminals are finding out just the opposite, that law enforcement is doing something about it. But the, the lack of regulation creates a perception that, that it's okay to, to, cr to create a crime around medical marijuana. Now, what you should also know is that the union has extensively analyzed crime statistics throughout the county of Los Angeles. And, cr and now, uh, we could probably attribute this to um, Chief Bratton for the most part, but crime has gone down across the county, across the board, in every jurisdiction. So um, that there's more crime because medical marijuana is a fallacy. So you're saying if, if they would just regulate the dispensaries, then it would just make it safer for everyone, I guess. Absolutely. Abs that is what everyone is clamoring. Most people don't, most people just want the regulations to be made. And patient advocates, including myself, have been clamoring at, at City Hall for the last two to three years, begging for them to come out with regulations that we could all live by. And they drug their feet, and now look at the calamity that's happened around the, the moratorium and, and, and it's, um, you know, the, the, the restraining order that came out against the city from enforcing the moratorium because they drug their feet so long. I know, and now I think they're finally kicking in, kicking in gear and are going to do something, but they need to come out with something sensible that will work for everyone. What uh, our city attorney, Trutonich, has come out with will not work for people. What it will do is it will drive patient associations underground, and then there will be more of a public nuisance than what we have right now. So, speaking of that, I know the, the federal government, the Justice Department, um, estimated that 200 raids were conducted at dispensaries in California alone just last year. And the Obama Justice Department has said that they were going to stop, I guess, enforcing or going after these dispensaries that are following state laws. But a even after that memo was put out, I think si four or five or six dispensaries just in L.A. were robbed. Um, is, is Rated. Rated, yes, mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, is there any Rob, same thing? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is is there any hope for these places to be to be free from uh, LAPD raids? There is, there is, and what the uh, the Obama policy came out with is a statement that said just as you just as you stated that they are going to uh, deprioritize the focus on on legally compliant patients and their associations. The key word is there. Clear the clear. Cure, I'm sorry. The the key words there are clear and unambiguously following the law. So what's important is that patient associations know how to follow the letter of the law. And that's something the Union of Medical Marijuana Patients is advocating for. We're, um, we have a membership drive right now and we're trying to make sure that everyone knows how to be legally compliant and follow Senate Bill 420 and the Attorney General's guidelines to a T so that they 
can avoid any kind of um, concern about federal interference. 